I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Brad Templeton, a well-known software developer, internet entrepreneur, online community pioneer, publisher, writer, photographer, civil rights advocate, futurist, public speaker, educator, and self-driving car consultant. Brad has a bachelor's in computer science from the University of Waterloo and a long career of remarkable achievements, including his current roles as a speaker, writer, and consultant at Robocars.com, chairman emeritus of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, chairman of networks and computers at Singularity University, and a former board member at BitTorrent.com, as well as being a self-driving car strategist at Google, advisor to DeepMap, Tilt5, Quan Energy, and much more. So Brad, welcome. It is truly a pleasure and a genuine honor to have you with us today, sir. Well, good afternoon, Tim. And uh, that was a bit too much introduction, I think, and mainly it's a result of being old. <laughs> well, so today we are talking about your latest project. You are working on autonomy and information technology. That has really been so much of your career, but you are into robocars right now. So I wanted to start out with that. Um, you have worked on those at the past at Google. And so I'm wondering what brought you back to self-driving car technology and where are you currently going with it? Well, I'm not sure you'd say anything brought me back, but uh, back in the um, early 2000s, it became clear that this was something that was possible. And the military ran a series of contests uh, for people to compete and try and build vehicles that could drive themselves. And the first contest was a terrible mess and nobody did anything. But the second contest, they actually made it work. And I met Sebastian Throne, who was the winner of that second contest, uh, and got to see the level of progress. And I realized this was going to make a very big change in the world. So I started getting fascinated by it, researching it, writing it, trying to uh, work out where it was going to go. And it led on from there. Well, so you have written that robocars could help reduce the 33,000 fatalities and over 1 million annual automobile accident injuries, as well as save a large portion of the $870 billion in damages those accidents cost, save up to 50 billion hours and 50 billion gallons of fuel wasted on driving, and help reclaim some of the land that is currently used for over 600 million parking spaces in the United States. That is a lot of savings, especially in terms of the fatalities and accident injuries, right, where robocars yeah. are not likely to make those. Well, those are the numbers just for the United States, by the way. Uh, it's a big world, so there's uh, almost one and a half million people killed every year in car accidents and uh, other big numbers. Uh, now, you won't get rid of all of them. The machines won't be perfect. They'll be better than humans, though, or they won't get on the road. And so that gives them the potential to do that. And uh, it's actually uh, the seventh largest cause of death in the United States, the largest cause of death for people who are younger than me. Um, and uh, so uh, that alone is enough to be very, very interesting. But really, cars have become such a big part of our lives, how we design our cities, where we live, where we work, how we get around, um, that changing that also has big consequences for the world. Well, so self-driving cars are today, but headlines about Tesla autopilot collisions have scared consumers, at least to some degree. And I'm wondering how the actual accident rates for robocars compare to human drivers in today's world. And based on advances in technology, how soon do you anticipate that we'll see trusted, reliable, self-driving systems on the road that consumers will buy into? Well, uh, in spite of the name that Tesla has given to um, the later version of their product, it isn't a self-driving product. It's, it's called a driver assist system, and it requires a human being behind the wheel actually have to be holding the wheel um, and not looking away uh, to supervise it and correct when it makes mistakes, which it does from time to time, and I, I do have that car and that system. Um, the actual self-driving projects, which are being done by a variety of teams around the world, are uh, not heavily deployed yet. However, there are, um, well, there were two companies in the United States that had uh, significant deployments. One of them, a unit of General Motors, has had to scale back after they ran into problems. There's four companies in China uh, doing significant deployments. And there are many startups and other companies waiting in the wings hoping to do deployments. Now, these pilot projects that were done by Waymo, which is what became of the Google car project that I worked on, um, and Cruise, 
Uh, they were demonstrating that they were having better safety records than human beings. Waymo has uh, demonstrated, released data demonstrating that they have a significantly better safety record. Not a perfect safety record. And, of course, some people think any mistake is a sign that automatically this can't happen or shouldn't be allowed. But they have demonstrated these records. People are skeptical now of Cruz's claim as to how good they were because uh, it was discovered not only did Cruz have some significant crashes, but that they were not being entirely forthright about everything that was going on. So that's led to a crisis for them. Uh, and some of the other companies that have tried to get into this, and it's very difficult and requires a lot of money and time, much more than most public companies or VCs are ready to put in. And some of those companies have fallen by the wayside. And in fact, well, uh, one of them didn't die this week, but it suffered a, uh, a dangerous wound uh, in that one of its backers pulled out. So it's very difficult and challenging. The rewards, if you succeed, are immense. Uh, it amounts to being in the catbird seat for what is a $7 trillion industry, with a T, uh, globally, the ground transportation industry. So having uh, you know an important role and a controlling role in that is well worth almost any investment if you can make it work. Now, of course, it's not easy to do that. Well, and I'm actually definitely on your side here. I have a Tesla. I have a Model 3. It has autopilot. In my case, I don't use that. I just drive traditionally. But it's one of those things where it has limitations. Those are clearly stated. And if I did use it, it would be, again, as you've said, a driver assist system and not a replacement for a human driver. But you know, one of the things I wanted to highlight for the audience was, um, you know, the Tesla autopilot does get confused sometimes by glare, reflections, non-standard road signs, right? This is not perfect technology by any means, but I think that we forget that human beings, uh, they can drive better under normal conditions, but they also drive tired, drunk, they get distracted by children, they talk and text on the phone, do makeup, eat and drink food, and have a variety of other dangerous distractions. And many of those are self-distractions, right? Those are things that, you know, we, we do or we have all done at some point, one or more of those, and we tend not to think about it, but they're things that could jeopardize our safety, and they lead, again, to those 33,000 fatalities and 1 million injuries. That I, I forgot to correct you on that. The 33,000 number comes from a few years ago. Against everyone's intuitions, the pandemic actually saw an increase in road fatalities in the United States. It's mm -hmm. now over 40,000, which is uh, disturbing, and people have got a lot of theories as to why that happened, but it did happen. Um, so, yes, robots don't get distracted. In fact, they're always looking every direction at once, everything everywhere all at once. They, they do that. Um, their mistakes are of a different sort, and their mistakes will still continue to happen, and that's the hard task that the teams are working on is to build them up so that their mistakes are at an acceptable level. What, do you think we're criticizing AI too heavily for these relatively few unexpected failures and then just taking our own dangerous road habits for granted? I mean, there are certainly people who do that. Not everyone does that. Uh, but it is a challenge. And if you're a regulator and your job is to improve safety on our roads for everyone, not just for individuals, uh, the challenge is that we people – we are very focused on incidents and tragedies and with perfectly understandable reasons. A regulator's job is to look at the big picture and try and say, how can I make the roads safer? Even if that means that uh, we might see a different type of vehicle on the road making different kinds of mistakes from people, if we have fewer mistakes, the regulator has done their job. But the public... Uh, I don't think it will ever think that way. And so it's a bit of a challenge to understand how to get people to accept this, how to accept the idea that, you know, I, I make a little joke about this. I say people don't like being killed by robots. We're just funny that way. Um, we'd rather be killed by drunks. Um, and that's that's what is happening. And it's surprising how accepting we are of it. Certainly, drunk runs someone over is on page 28 of the newspaper. Uh, but a small accident with robot is because it's new. It's on page one. And we'll have to adapt to that and make a decision about whether or not we want roads that are overall safer. The other thing that people don't understand is that robots are learning. I mean, they're not 
physically learning the way human beings do. But each time there's a mistake made in one of, with, with one of these cars, um, it is fixed. And the robots don't make that mistake again. They may make others. They may make mistakes like it, but they don't make that mistake again. That's, <clears throat> that's not the way human beings are. If one person makes a mistake on the road, it doesn't mean every other human learns, don't do that. All right? Each human learns on their own pace. We put teenagers out on the road. They're not very good drivers. They're worse than these robots for sure. But we let them on the road because that's the only way we know to turn them into mature drivers uh, who will make fewer mistakes. And they will as they get older and get more experience. Well, the robots are getting more experiencing, but experience, but they're getting it as a fleet. And so that means that today, these pilot projects, these are going to be the worst the robots will ever be. And people are judging them at their worst and not thinking about the fact that when we get these out here, and they get better, then they'll be deployed in large fleets. Today, they're very small fleets. When they're deployed in large fleets, they're going to be a lot better, and they're going to reduce the risk on the roads a lot. And so we don't want to make the mistake of being afraid of the risk that's presented today while they're learning, and in exchange for that, taking vastly more risk in the future because they don't get out there and get a drunk guy going home from a bar to switch from driving himself to letting a machine drive him. And uh, this is not the sort of philosophical decision that people are likely to make, actually. We don't tend to think that way. Uh, but mathematically, it's, it's, boy, is it the right thing to do. Well, that's an excellent point. Not only is the software improving, but the hardware keeps improving, too, right? And I think that that's something that we have to keep in mind is a lot of this depends on the quality of cameras, the integration between the cameras and the computer systems, the processing power and memory that's in those computers, you know, their ability to process that at speed. That continues to improve as well, along with the training, which you've mentioned is fleet-wide, right? When one yeah. thing is learned, it's applied to all of them. Well, so. But all that people should care about, though, is what is the final result? And what is the final result at scale over a large fleet of vehicles, not the final result of an individual vehicle or individual driver? Well, so I wanted to ask if today's robocars are setting the stage for tomorrow's EVTOLs. That's something that has truly been close to my heart for several years now. Uh, you know, lots of Americans can drive, very few can pilot. But as this technology gets perfected, I'm wondering if we will see those same principles extended into flight for crowded urban landscapes. Well, the funny thing is that flying is actually much easier to automate than driving. Um, flying is it's actually pretty simple and straightforward, and pilots wouldn't think so because they have a lot to do. And compared to driving a car, they have uh, you know 50 items on their checklist to do every time they take off, and they have a lot of other challenging things. And there's never been an air traffic control system that could handle you know having thousands of uh, or, or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, as people would dream, of vehicles in the air all trying to get somewhere. Those are not solved problems. But nonetheless, the basic idea of just taking an aircraft along a path, even lifting off and landing, actually not so hard. I mean, the planes follow each other by huge distances. Cars follow each other by distances where you can read the bumper sticker. So uh, that's not the hard problem, I think, in many ways. It's a bit of a hard problem for the FAA to adapt to a world of automated flight compared to the world that they've known and uh, in uh, regulated for quite some time, uh, but they will in time. They want to. They're actually interested in moving towards a world where there can be more air traffic. Um, the engineering problems for making these vehicles work at short range, I mean, under 100 miles or so on, those are actually pretty close to solved. A uh, number of people have built those vehicles physically. There's still that software problem you described, and um, there's a noise problem that still has to be worked out. I I've made a joke that I would love to have an EV told in my backyard and I would fly everywhere. I refuse to let my neighbors have one, though. Um, and uh, as you can see, that doesn't scale up. But there are potential solutions to that problem as well, as there are also people who are just trying to make the vehicles even quieter. They're much quieter than helicopters, um, traditional helicopters, but they're still not quite quiet enough. Uh, but I don't see anything really intractable there. But I do also see an industry that's at a very early level of maturity. And it is, you know, it is not even at the state that I looked at the self-driving car industry 10 years ago, and the self-driving cars are just 
now getting on the roads. So I'm sadly not expecting to have my EV toll um, anytime this decade. Uh, by the way, uh, it's also not planned by most companies that you would own a self-driving car. Most companies want you to hire it as a taxi, you know, like an Uber. Um, rather than have one that's that you own and sits in your garage, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and that is also the case for most of the EV tolls. Although uh, the company uh, Blackfly or Opener, sorry, which has changed its name to Pivot, I guess they pivoted, uh, and they're quite aware of the irony of that joke. Um, they have actually sold one to a customer, but for recreational use, not for going beyond that or going very far. Uh, well, it, the reason I ask about that actually goes back to my own past. When I lived in the Seattle area, I used to commute across the 520 bridge every day. And, you know, I saw so many people who were just jam-packed into bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. You know, and that bridge, I don't remember what it is. It's like five or ten miles over the water. and That's the, the thought, Evergreen it, Floating Bridge? Yeah. And yeah. the thought always occurred to me, you know, if there was some kind of air transportation, I mean, the wealthier people out there would probably adopt that just to save time getting to work, right? And for an uh, the plan, by the way, the plan is not that it's for the wealthy. Maybe in year one it's for the wealthy, but the long term <laughs> plan is definitely not that it's just for the wealthy. Yeah, I, I, I thought that it might be similar to Tesla, right? The early Teslas were very expensive. The average person couldn't afford them. But as the company scaled up, the cost has come down. And now it's something that middle class people are driving. And, you know, it's it's becoming more seen on the roadways. And I had hoped to see EVTOLs do the same thing, where, you know, I, the initial versions of those, like the Jetson 1 and the E-Hang, those are, the last time I looked, the prices were incredibly high but i guess the hope would be you know as they start to produce those and get that manufacturing economy of scale going they might be able to make those affordable for the middle class and then we would all have our flying cars like we were promised back in the 50s have them or as i said hi call them like a a, a flying them. uber uh, uber indeed was actually very active in this space for a while they pulled back a bit but uh, that is, that's a hope. Now, that's not a hope for day one. Yeah, of course, it's going to start with rich dudes. Um, but it's, it's going to change. Well, in terms of autonomous flight, I also wanted to touch on drone deliveries. So Alphabet's wing claims to have made over 330,000 drone air deliveries. That was at a test facility in California. Uh, Walmart partner Zipline claimed over 600,000 fixed-wing commercial deliveries in African markets. Mm -hmm. And Amazon's Prime Air has reportedly made over 100 drone deliveries in two U.S. test markets. So from what I understand, these systems are also definitely still in development, although the drone technology seems like it's a little bit more conventional, right, than something like an EVTOL. Um, but I'm wondering if this is an indicator, not only that we'll be seeing a lot of autonomous flight in general in the future, but also a massive increase in autonomous logistics in general. Well, uh, unfortunately, Amazon Prime Air, for example, has been shut down as a project, um, and several other drone companies. Actually, well, the first drone delivery company was uh, students of mine, a company called Matternet, uh, and uh, they're still there. But in fact, Zipline is doing what they originally dreamed of doing. Uh, but that's okay. There's room for lots of companies to compete. Now, I helped build a company uh, in Estonia, which operates all around the world, called Starship, which does robot delivery on the sidewalks on the ground, not in the air. Um, and I will joke that uh, compared to the flying drones, we have an easier time landing. Uh, and it does turn out that landing is sort of the hard problem for people trying to do this. You know, everyone can make a drone that takes off from a depot and you put a package into it and it flies somewhere. Getting that package onto the ground is uh, in like in the millions of different configurations of homeowners and so on is the difficult part. Zipline, when it delivers medicine in Africa, uh, has a sort of a little parachute and a, a place to drop it into uh, that's pre-prepared. To deliver to people's houses is a little more difficult. Uh, for um, urgent items, though, the drone will be a good thing, the, um, like really urgent items. The delivery robots takes one to two hours, and so it's not as urgent, although it's much more urgent than, say, two-day delivery of stuff from Amazon. 
Um, yeah, it makes sense to have robots do a lot of that, what they call last mile delivery, whether they fly or whether they roll on the ground. Uh, I think they'll both have some value. Uh, just because we think of delivery as free, uh, but is not. Uh, it's just everyone bundles it into the price. And uh, having a human being bring you your dinner, it costs usually a minimum of $5, more likely 10 It's And even more than that will often be factored into the price of a, an order you might make for food or groceries to be delivered in that way. If a truck brings 200 packages, that can be more efficient. That can be, you know, just a small amount per package. But for those packages that can't be brought in that truck because they, they can't come in two days, like groceries and restaurant orders and things like that, having machines do it makes a lot of sense. Well, and this takes us into AI. And again, this is one of the reasons that I'm so absolutely excited to have you with me, because you have, I'm, you have knowledge and expertise across so many of these different verticals, right? And so... Um, in terms of AI, I guess so I should you're saying touch I have on... horizontal knowledge of verticals. Well, maybe. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to touch on OpenAI's ChatGPT and Google Bard. Right, those have been consistently making headlines. And again, if if anyone could talk about the trajectory of where these things are going, you can. So I'm wondering. I, I should start out by asking if these LLM approaches to AI are the right path, in your opinion, or do you think that we're kind of pushing forward to something that's ultimately going to be a dead end? Well, the, no, nobody can answer that question. I mean, the, there is no doubt that LLMs are immensely powerful and much more powerful than anybody expected. Uh, and so, of course, there's a great deal of excitement about them. Will they do everything? Probably not. I mean, I don't think there's anyone who, well, sorry, I do run occasionally into people who claim that these approaches just add more compute and they'll, there is no limit on what they can do. And I've seen that argument. I'm not sure it's convincing yet, uh, although I'm not sure, 100% sure it's false either. Um, but nonetheless, immensely powerful and powerful for more than what you would think they'd be powerful for, which was language manipulation, LLM, the L stands for language. They are trained by reading everything, basically, uh, and uh, that they do things outside of the realm of language is also very interesting. They are being used for self-driving cars to plan um, where they will drive. Um, the knowledge learned from that is being applied in that space. Uh, they're being used in uh, computer vision and identifying things. We've seen how they also have worked in uh, generating well, generative AI making uh, illustrations and photographs and art and so on. We've seen them extend their power in that way. So very interesting technology. Um, universally powerful, that's not something anyone has the answer to right now. Although Peter Norvig, a friend of mine who runs uh, uh, Google's research area, and he's, uh, he's the author of a number of the leading textbooks on AI, so he's um, a very good person to ask about this, has come to the conclusion that we should call um, LLMs, the first artificial general intelligence, which made people look up because usually that phrase meant as smart as a human or smarter than a human to be a general. We're, we are the only general intelligence that we know of, uh, humans and, and maybe some higher of the other apes and so on, uh, general intelligences. Uh, and the reason he said these are general intelligences because we train them in one thing and they have skills in another thing. There was never an AI or a software tool that had that ability before. For the first time, we see it. We, it's not as smart as a human. Nobody thinks it is a, a, a match for a human being, although there's things that these tools can do that human beings can't as well. It's always been true of computers, though. When they did something, they did something better than us and missed out on other things. But Anyway, uh, anyone who doesn't think they're very important and interesting is making a mistake. Uh, are they, you know, the, the last thing anyone has to do? No, I don't think so. Well, so as the chairman emeritus of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, I have to ask you, you know, how, how is the EFF approaching this? Because it has been a staunch defender of digital privacy, freedom of speech, and innovation for human beings in the past. And, and continues to be. So yeah. I'm wondering if these positions will extend to AI as kind of our children of mind, so to speak. Well, I, I do there have to disclaim a bit because the reason the word emeritus is there is because I was the chairman. I'm not the chairman anymore. Um, and so I can't speak for 
for them today and what their, um, you know, how they change the view. The EFF has always taken the view, though, that uh, code is speech, and that includes AI, so that it's not that's something that uh, should not be regulated in uh, the way that some people want to regulate it, certainly in terms of publishing it and distributing it. Uh, the EFF uh, probably, I mean, again, I can't speak for their position today, uh, has the same concerns that many people have about its effect on society and how the tools will be used. Um, an, in an issue that I'm actually writing an article about right now uh, and haven't really, I'm, I'm going to complete it pretty soon, uh, which is very dear to the EFF, is the relationship of copyright law and um, all sorts of software systems, but these AIs in particular. Uh, you may know that the New York Times uh, filed a fairly well-known lawsuit against OpenAI over yeah. ChatGPT, and the reason that uh, they were the, the, that they cite in their lawsuit is that they have gone to ChatGPT and given it prompts to say, "Hey, can you tell me what the first paragraph was of this article about such and such a topic in the New York Times?" And it can output that article, not. Sometimes very close to exactly, usually with a little thing here or a little thing there different, but but something that would definitely be viewed as a plagiarism or copyright infringement if you were looking at it inside any context. And if you look at it just as a standard, here's a deterministic algorithm that can output a um, a piece of text that it read when it was being constructed, that's a copyright violation. And it would be sort of slam dunk. But I don't think it is slam dunk. I think this is a much more subtle and complex issue that brings into, uh, for example, copyright has in it a specific exemption called fair use that says that there are a number of things you can do without the permission of a copyright holder if they meet certain public interest goals. And I think, now you'll get some argument on this question, but I think that having these AI tools is super useful and being able to build them and, and allow them to work on hard problems is very much in the public interest. Now, there are people who are saying, but people are also using these tools for evil, and so therefore I don't think they're in the public interest, but that's somewhat orthogonal to this. They definitely have a lot of good uses, a lot of powerful uses, and it's in the public interest that these be able to be developed. And if you think that they have too many evil uses, well, then you should just say they shouldn't happen at all. It's not a question of whether they violate copyrights or not. It's a question of are they good for humanity or not. But if they land on the side of good because they have powerful functions which can help humanity, and most people do think they do, and they're spending billions because they think that, um, well, the fact that they had to read uh, all the material out on the web, mo almost all of which is copyrighted, to do so might still be in the public interest. It might be that you'd say, no, that's not a copyright violation because it was a fair use. Certainly, we've never thought that if someone wanted to go get an education and they did so by reading copyrighted works, um, that that was a copyright violation. Yeah. Uh, in fact, and here's where we get a little weird and philosophical, I assume there are poems and songs that you could recite for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah everyone well, I, can, yes. So are you a copyright violation? Because you, Do you have a copy of that poem in your brain? Well, that's what came to my mind. That's exactly the case that came to my mind. I, I was like, why don't we hold AI to the same standards that we hold humans to? Well, no, the answer to that's pretty obvious. They aren't humans. They don't work the way humans do. And anyone would laugh at the idea of suggesting that a human being who is able to recite a poem um, has, a co has made an illegal copy of that poem. Now, by the way, if that human being wrote that poem out and then handed it to someone else, that would be a copyright violation if it was a copyrighted poem, right? Yeah. Um, the fact that you can memorize things isn't a copyright violation. The, if you do it, if you duplicate things, that is a copyright violation or can be. And likewise for the AI. Now, if you go to ChatGPT and ask it for this New York Times article, um, that is a copyright violation. But is its existence a copyright violation? That's the more interesting question of this lawsuit. Now, the New York Times can't really sue over the fact that it made a copy because it was the New York Times that asked it <laughs> for the copy it came out. Right? Um, in the law, the law very much doesn't think machines exist in terms of liability. Machines are not ever responsible for things. It's always what human being violated the law. It's never a machine that violated the law. A human being built something, the building of it might be illegal. A human being, being used some. So if I go into the library and I take out a book and photocopy it, I am making a, photo, uh, a copyright violation. 
The photocopier company is not. Uh, and the library generally is not. There actually have been some cases where some uh, there was a Kinko's that was found liable because they were basically, you know, ignoring blatant <laughs> violation. But short of that, the library, the owner of the, the co copy machine, not liable. So we've had uh, a lot of complexity around this. And what I'm saying about you memorizing a poem, because, again, that's obviously not a copyright violation. Yeah. More to the point, I don't think you have in your brain anything we would think of as a copy of the poem. Um, we don't, of course, understand how the brain works, and we don't understand how these neural networks work. We do know that the neural networks work in a way that was inspired by biological neurons, um, but we don't know that it's this, exactly the same. In fact, we're pretty confident it's not exactly the same, although it may have parallels. So what is it doing when it stores the poem? So there, you might argue, because... One of the things that's very impressive about ChatGPT is that if it's got a copy of all those things it read in there, it's done data compression at a level far beyond anything we ever imagined was possible. Um, so it's not really storing the poem. What it's doing is it's storing, it's gathering statistics on everything it reads. That's what it does. And nobody would have said in the past that simply analyzing text and gathering statistics on it is a copyright violation. If I write a program that reads all the stuff in the New York Times and tells you they used the word, you know, Trump 593 times last year or whatever, well, much more than that. But if I wrote a program to do that, no one would say that's a copyright violation. It's clearly distilled down to statistics. So training a, a large language model is just distilling it to statistics. But at a scale which has never been done before and with capabilities that have never been seen before. So it's really a much more complex issue than it seems at the first. I'm not saying that we might not decide that this is a copyright violation, but it's not the clear slam dunk that um, the New York Times hopes or that many other people think when you see the argument that they've made. Um, I think ChatGPT has learned how to write articles the way the New York Times does. And it has also remembered a tiny bit of information about how the New York Times wrote this particular article it's being asked about, because it read them all, of course. It read everything, gathered statistics on everything. Um, and uh, so I don't know what side of the line we're going to fall on. It's incredibly interesting, and there are so many opinions out there. Um, you know, so I want to jump into the, the jobs aspect of this, though. So chat GPT is seen as a threat to writers and programmers. Mid-journey threatens artists and illustrators. Robocars could potentially replace taxi and bus drivers. And this list just goes on. Now, there's a growing public fear that AI will take all jobs. But I'm wondering, is this justified or is this just another form of neoludism? Well, you do see two reactions to it. Uh, one is, hey, here's an AI, it's going to be able to do half the work you do in your job. And some people say, oh my God, that's a threat to my livelihood. And the other say, uh, when can I get that? Shut up and take my money. Um, I, I would love to have a machine do half of my work. Now, the, I don't know if those two will ever be reconciled, but we have indeed been concerned about machines replacing human labor for a little bit of time. In fact, it goes back a few hundred years. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a large collection of books, actually, we have that uh, written going back into the 19th century about this problem. Uh, I once was at a meeting that we put together to look at this problem, and we all agreed it was a very serious problem. And uh, it was proposed by someone that's saying, you know, this is such a serious problem, we should write a letter to the President of the United States. You know about Einstein, when he was worried about nuclear weapons, he wrote a letter to oh, the President yeah. of the United States. Yeah. Very famous that these letters have been written. He said, maybe it's time for that kind of letter to talk about the concern. And uh, so people started thinking about what would be in the letter, and someone at the back of the room says, oh, wait a minute, someone already wrote one. I found it. And he pulled out the letter, and he says, Dear President Johnson, uh, is how the letter begins. So... Uh, this has been written before and will be written again. We have, in fact, predicted that there will be horrible doom and gloom as machines replace people in labor. Um, I, I don't know if I have an exact enumeration, but literally dozens of times uh, there have been predictions of that sort, how dire and serious it is and how everyone has to worry. And every time we've made that prediction, it's been wrong. There's been more employment in the future, not less. 200 years ago, 98% of the population worked in agriculture. 
now 2% of the population work in agriculture, and nobody thinks that was a horrible thing where everyone lost their jobs. A hundred years ago, it was still 50% of the population that worked in agriculture. And just over that, you know, that period of which the lifetime of some people, some of the older people alive, we've seen that happen. So that's always been the pattern of history. Now, when told that, many people respond, well, yes, that's always been the pattern of history, but this time it is different. It, then you go back and you say, you know, all these other times when people said it was big, they also said this time it was different. So once again, you've got to find out how can you tell if – it doesn't mean that someday it won't be different, right? Obviously, there's, you can't totally discount the fears because someday – Maybe the calamity does come, but you have a burden of proof to say that you have reached that particular time, and what are you going to do? Um, nonetheless, it is happening faster. That part is that difference is very clear, and so there are people who will be concerned. And yes, taxi driver might not be a uh, big popular career in a few years. And I've asked crowds of people: When you were young, uh, did you dream of growing up to be a cab driver? And, of course, no one puts up their hand. That's, uh, you know, Uber driver, cab driver is a job which people just take to make some money for a while. It's not something that yeah. is generally viewed as a career. So that one I don't feel too bad about. There are other ones where uh, I think you can see some real concern. Now, truck driver is another one which is a career for some people. But there is a massive shortage of truck drivers out there. Even if they automated, you know, 200,000 trucks, it wouldn't dent the labor market for truck drivers. Eventually it might, but certainly no uh, urgent worry today. Uh, in fact, what will happen is machines are going to do more of the tasks you do in your job, and you will switch to doing other tasks, tasks that you are better at. And maybe it is different this time, and you'll see someone get to that point where they have nothing left to do, and they have to retrain, and they're uh, at an age where that's difficult. And so we should look at what will happen to those people, and we should look at finding ways to cushion that fall and help society adapt to it. But so far, society has adapted to it every time. Well, that takes us to the singularity. And again, you are one of the key people to ask about this. I mean, just because of your past work with Singularity University. So Ray Kurzweil's estimated date, I believe, is 2045. Uh, but recently, I have been speaking with people who believe that it may come sooner than that, just due to this rapid pace of development in AI and technology. So do you think that Singularity will happen at all? And will it still be on his projected timeline of around 2045, or do you think that we should be pushing that date up a little sooner? Well, I am wary of anyone who names the dates, even Ray. Um, now, Ray comes up with a date because he does actually a fairly um, simple extrapolation of uh, not Moore's Law anymore, but the broad trend that Moore's Law is a part of, of computing getting cheaper and faster. And he says, if this trend continues, by 2045, you know, a small amount of money can buy enough computing to match every human brain on Earth. And he doesn't see how you wouldn't have something as dramatic as a singularity if you're at that point. Um, he says in 2029, actually, that those trend lines point to being able to get the computing power in a human brain for, you know, the price of a laptop sort of thing. And uh, and clearly, if that happens, and the trend lines have been pretty reliable and strong, although people argue about they're always saying Moore's Law is finally over and so on, and they're so far they're always wrong, but uh, that doesn't mean they'll be right forever, or wrong forever, I mean. Uh, so that's where Ray gets his number from, and it's a very broad number prediction. Now, the term singularity was coined by a friend of mine, Werner Vinge, a writer um, from, in Southern California, and... What Werner actually defined it to be uh, at its in, in a metaphorical sense was simply a change so dramatic that you cannot predict what happens after it because you just don't have yeah. the tools to understand that world. And an example of a singularity that's already happened would be uh, our invention of language, which admittedly quite some time ago <laughs> that humans finally uh, uh, figured out language. But... Now that we humans have language, if you were to go to, say, an ape or some, you know, a proto-human from a million years ago 
and try and explain to them what our world of language is like. Well, they don't have language, so you just could never explain it. They could never understand it, right? Um, that's a singularity where there's a future and they they can't even talk about it. And so are we coming to another future that we don't have the tools to talk about? Yeah, probably. The number of the year that it happens in, I don't think that's too wise to make many predictions about. However, the broad prediction that it might happen in the lifetime of people listening to this uh, is more and more likely as things get bigger and stronger. And so that's why people want to talk about it. Now, at Singularity University, I used to make the joke that it's not about the singularity. It's not really a university. It's just it's a fun and interesting thing to, to study. And that was true because we actually almost never talked about the singularity concept at that place. Um, that doesn't mean it's not an interesting concept, but it's, it is, it's a concept that by definition you cannot say much about. And mm, that, uh, okay. of course, people can't resist the temptation, even Ray and Werner can't resist the temptation. Well, Werner was pretty good about it. He he knew he couldn't write. He wrote fiction, science fiction, and he couldn't write characters that were, you know, smarter than a human being. He said, how can I write a character that's smarter than a human being? So he, he said, I will just never write that character. Or I'll try and avoid that. Uh, I'll write the story of humans who are living in a world where those are having an effect, but I won't write the story of, you know, I won't see the point of view of a supermind anymore than, you know, a, a, a monkey could write the story from a human point of view. Because I can't write it all, but even if they could, they couldn't write that. Ah, well, on that note, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Truly a pleasure. And again, absolutely a tremendous honor to have you with me today. I'm so excited to have been able to cover all of these topics. And again, you are one of the only people who can speak on all of these. Just this, this breadth and depth of knowledge is amazing. So thank you again. Uh, Brad, let me close by asking, what is coming up for you in the first part of 2024? And what do you see, if anything, do you have any predictions on what we'll see in headlines in terms of robocars or AI or anything like that in the next few months? The robocar headlines are challenging right now because, as I say, we've seen bad news happen to a lot of people. We, we see good news at the same time. A Waymo just announced or made their application so they could serve the entire San Francisco Peninsula. So that's like a, a really big area with lots of people, and lots of money. And likewise, a large section of Los Angeles, they also plan, plan to show. The Chinese companies are going gangbusters as well. Um, but Cruise and possibly Motional, that's uh, the company that had the bad news this week, uh, they have suffered uh, downturns and Ford shut down their division as well. A lot mm. of people are running into just how hard the problem is. And so that leaves us in an uncertain state as to what the, the future will show. Now, Cruise does intend to come back. They've had to scale back. They've cut their spending quite a lot. Um, but they're not dead yet, or they would cut their spending entirely. I mean, if they... If they decided it was just not worth it anymore, they wouldn't still put a billion in, even though they're not putting two billion in. Still putting a billion, that's not chump change. So um, I wouldn't count them out in that way. But uh, I, I have, uh, since uh, the beginning of this, I actually predicted that the middle of the 2020s would be the period when the, the releases get real and we start getting a land rush. And my prediction seems actually, uh, you know, I, I always say you should never name dates or something like that. And I only gave them the most vague dates. But so far, not too far off the track. We'll see, you know, whether I'm now proved horribly wrong. Um, I am, however, a brilliant futurist. And I will tell you that all of my predictions that I remember have been correct. So uh, uh, that is unfortunately a fault that many other people have as well. Uh, I... Um, I actually don't have a, um, a super busy schedule planned right now because I don't have any one big venture on. I'm mostly just advising startups and investing in them and uh, and doing some writing, uh, maybe uh, and doing some travel. Um, you know, all the traveling and speaking, of course, just went to zero during the virus, and it's taking its time to uh, return itself, so I'm hoping that it will. But uh, there's a, a nice big world to explore nonetheless. So... Um, uh, yeah, I, have, I haven't actually picked what the next big thing I want to work on is. Uh, although I still am very interested in what's going on in mobility because there's still a lot more to happen there. Brad, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. All right. Good afternoon to you, too.